Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us tonight for Illinois Bone and Joint Institute's 16th virtual YMCA education series program with the North Suburban YMCA. My name is Karen Brownlee, and I'm a personal trainer and the adult program coordinator at the NSYMCA in Northbrook, Illinois. We are recording this evening's presentation so that you can revisit it again. Please feel free to tell your family and friends about it so that they too can view it on either the IBJI or NSYMCA websites. Tonight's program entitled Outpatient Joint Replacement, an Alternative Approach to a Rapid Recovery will be hosted by Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein. Total joint replacements performed in an outpatient facility, not in a hospital, are becoming more and more common. Benefits of outpatient joint replacement include faster recovery and mobility, reduced risk of infection, recovery in your own home, and lower overall cost. This alternative approach allows you to leave the facility within a few hours after surgery. Outpatient surgical procedures and techniques offer the same quality of care as inpatient procedures. The simple change of location gives patients the opportunity to return home while ensuring the same level of recovery and rehabilitation. Dr. Goldstein will explain the advantages and benefits of outpatient joint replacement. Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein is a board certified orthopedic surgeon specializing in adult hip and knee reconstruction and replacement surgery. He is one of the few surgeons in the area who spent an additional year learning the direct anterior approach for hip replacement surgery from some of the nation's most respected hip surgeons. In addition to primary hip and knee replacement, he focuses on complex revision surgery, addressing complications such as instability, implant loosening, metallosis, periprosthetic infection, periprosthetic fractures, and extensor mechanism disruptions. After completing his undergraduate degree at the University of Pennsylvania, Dr. Goldstein returned to his native Chicago for medical school and residency training. He subsequently completed a fellowship at the Ortho Carolina Hip and Knee Center, one of the nation's most prestigious orthopedic training programs. Thank you again for joining us this evening. And thank you, Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein, for your time and effort in putting together this presentation to teach us about a rapid recovery to outpatient joint replacements. Now, please take it from here. Well, thank you, Karen. Can, can you hear me and see my screen, first of all? Yes. Perfect. All right, so I appreciate the introduction. I'm Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein, and um, thank you for having me and for all the attendees. Thank you for coming. I have a four-year-old and six-year-old that are, are playing right outside that door, and uh, hopefully they'll be respectful of the webinar, but we'll, we'll see if there's too much noise. Uh, I've entitled this talk, Pain Management Enhanced Recovery Protocols in Outpatient Total Joint Replacement, because you know outpatient total joint replacement is, is what we're talking about, but we really need to understand the context of how we got to where we are now and sort of where we're going. Uh, I really have no financial disclosures relevant to this talk, but just generally speaking, why do we even care about this topic? Well, in today's healthcare environment, there's an emphasis on the concept of value. So it's not just about volume or how many surgeries you can do, it's about the quality of your outcomes and the reduction of cost. And so that value proposition is always outcomes over cost. And so that's driven primarily by uh, payers such as Medicare, insurance companies, but also employers and hospital systems um, with which we all engage with. There's also patient demand for enhanced recovery and outpatient surgery, getting, getting back to activity quicker. There's concerns about the opioid epidemic and finding alternative ways to control pain in a, in a manner better than, than we've done in previous generations of joint replacement surgeries. And then finally, surgeons want what's best for their patients. So I think, you know, we, we spend a lot of time talking about surgical technique and, um, and, and different implants, but the reality is we're really trying to evolve the entire perioperative experience to give patients better outcomes. So it's not just about what we do during surgery, it's what we do surrounding the entire surgical experience. So just a couple quick points, osteoarthritis, which is the most common type of arthritis that we take care of, it's sort of that degenerative joint uh, disease. 46 million uh, American adults report that they've been diagnosed with arthritis by a doctor. There's probably millions more that have never been formally diagnosed, but suffice it to say it's a, it's a major problem in the United States. 
And as the population increases and the baby boomers become Medicare age, these numbers are expected to increase dramatically. And we expect that that 46 million is going to go up to upwards of 67 million by the year 2030. So osteoarthritis is sort of a growing problem in our ability to manage them effectively, but also efficiently um, is, is a big uh, source of emphasis on and sort of what we're doing in the healthcare arena. When we talk about arthritis, what we're really talking about is what's happening in our synovial joints. So synovial joints are any joint where there's motion in the body. So your hips, your knees, your shoulders, your elbows, they're all example of synovial joints. And this is just a schematic, but you have two bones that come together surrounded by a joint capsule with this uh, lubricating synovial fluid. And at the end of the bone, you have what's called articular cartilage. You can think of it like the white at the end of a chicken bone. It's a smooth, slick surface where all of the, the motion takes place. And so if you look, what usually is, is nice and slick, excuse me, good time for an update, uh, over time, and there's different reasons this happened, we sometimes see that that, uh, that articular cartilage can start to degenerate, delaminate, fray, and so what becomes a smooth surface becomes more of a frictiony surface, and that's what happens in arthritic joints. And when that happens, we see this vicious cycle of uh, pain and inflammation of the joints. So arthritis causes pain in the joints, and when patients have painful joints, they are reluctant to move. And this avoidance of motion causes increased surrounding muscle tightness. Uh, there's contracting of the capsular tissue, which leads to loss of motion further, uh, and the loss of motion in and of itself is uncomfortable and painful, and this perpetuates this cycle. The way we diagnose arthritis, whether it's hip or knee, uh, is, is still primarily with x-rays. That's the, the gold standard, and it's, it's cheap and effective. So here's a picture of a healthy knee, and what you're seeing is there's joint space remaining between the two ends of the bone. Well, that space is not filled with air. It's really filled with cartilage. You just can't see cartilage on an X-ray. Over time, as people's knees degenerate and you get this arthritic condition, what you see here, there's no more cartilage between the bones. The bones are now grinding on each other. And this, is, this would be an example of what we call end-stage arthritis or bone-on-bone -bone arthritis. And that's an example of a knee. Here's a picture of a arthritic hip. And so the ball and socket joint, you can see what, what used to have good joint space has now completely eroded. And that patient presumably has quite a bit of groin pain and stiffness trying to clip their toenails or putting on their socks and shoes. And, and we know there's a spectrum of treatment options ranging from conservative approaches with medications, injections, physical therapy. But at the end of the day, the, the only true solution or cure for an arthritic joint is joint replacement surgery. And so uh, here's a picture of a knee replacement, uh, at least a model of one. And what you see is a knee replacement is actually sort of a resurfacing of the ends of the bone, the end of the thigh bone and the shin bone. Um, and in between the metal prostheses is a, um, is a plastic dish, effectively. And so instead of having bone grinding on bone, which is very painful, you have metal gliding on plastic. Well, metal and plastic doesn't have nerve endings, and that's why it's not particularly painful. Uh, for a hip, this is an x-ray of a hip. Metal is always white on an x-ray. And so what you see is that bone-on-bone -bone ball and socket has been replaced by a metal head articulating with a plastic liner within a metal shell. That's what it looks like on an x-ray at least. Some terminology, when, when we say the term arthroplasty, so plasty means to create a new and arthro means joint. So total knee arthroplasty, total hip arthroplasty is our terminology for knee replacement and hip replacement. Um, and just in case I use those terms. Um, and these are very successful for patients of different ages and activity levels. And it's, it's pretty amazing now, the spectrum of demographics of patients that we take care of. It's just like, we can do a hip replacement on a 40 year old, and then the next patient's a knee replacement in a 95 year old. So, you know, we, we no longer really look at chronologic age. What really matters is physiologic age that helps uh, determine our decision making in terms of whether patients are good candidates for surgery. So joint replacement surgery, in general, the goals are and have always been to relieve pain, to restore function, 
and to provide a long-lasting durable prosthesis. And the truth is that these long-term goals have never changed, they, and they still are the primary goals in what we're doing. What has changed is this emphasis on getting patients back home, getting reacclimated to their home environment, getting patients back to work quicker, getting patients back to activities more quickly, and just back to life sooner than they were uh, in the past. And so I wanna, again, to bring us up to, to date on why we're doing outpatient joints and doing this more rapid recovery uh, approach, I wanna go back in time and explain sort of what the surgical experience was like for patients uh, in a prior generation. So back in the day, and, and this is as recently as a decade ago, uh, these surgeries were done exclusively in a hospital setting. And at that time, there was no preoperative medication provided for patients' pain relief before surgery. The patients would undergo anesthesia for their surgery, and they would get a very deep general anesthesia or a long-lasting epidural anesthesia, which certainly worked. They put patients to sleep to allow them to get their surgery. Depending on the surgeon, surgeries would sometimes take hours and hours to perform. And during this period of time, the anesthesiologist would give large quantities of IV narcotic medications. And, and what would happen is these patients would wake up, they'd be in severe pain once their anesthesia wore off, but they'd have a lot of side effects or symptoms of things like nausea, dizziness, lethargy, different symptoms that would really inhibit their ability to mobilize quickly. And so patients were left in bed until these symptoms were under control. And that's sometimes uh, would be you know upwards of 48 hours before they'd get them out of bed. They'd be laying in bed with Foley catheters, not doing any physical therapy, and consequently patients would stay in the hospital on the order of days uh, to weeks. And, and I remember when I was an intern in 2008, a joint replacement surgery patient was typically in the hospital for an average of five days before they leave the hospital. I remember it was considered a big landmark achievement when I was a fifth year resident in 2013, and we had reduced that length of stay down to three days. And just as a, to give an idea of how far things have come in just a short period of time, I've only been in practice for seven years. Uh, in the past, pain control, and this is now more post-operatively, was really limited to IV and oral opioids. And, we used to give these patients what's called a PCA, which was patient-controlled analgesia. And what this was, was a pain pump with narcotic that a patient would have control over and they would sort of hit their button every eight to 10 minutes to give them a jolt of IV pain medication, whether it was morphine or Dilaudid. And it was, it was effective with uh, reducing pain. The problem is it's short lasting and you can't go home with a PCA pump. And so they become hard to wean off of to get good pain control. Back uh, in a prior generation, blood transfusions were not infrequent. They were actually quite frequent to a point where they used to have patients bank their own uh, autologous blood. So they used to have patients donate one or two units of their own blood, set, you know, a month or two before surgery, let their blood levels rise, and then retransfuse them their own blood because of acute post-op blood loss. Well, well, not only is that not done anymore, they, they actually recommend against it, and frankly, it's no longer necessary, and I'll explain why. Uh, patients would eventually improve, uh, with previous hip and knee replacements to a point where they were medically stable and they would be discharged. Primarily, they'd be discharged to a skilled nursing facility where they would spend on average of three weeks in a rehab facility before they were mobilized enough to go home. And, and, and again, back, back then, you know, Medicare Part B didn't bat an eye. They didn't really care. Um, they didn't really restrict these things. And so they would just let patients hang out for three weeks until patients uh, had symptoms that were improved to a point where they can go home. And then after several months, patients would improve clinically. And, and the reality is patients ultimately had a good outcome after hip and knee replacements. It was just a much slower drawn out process. So I wanna sort of switch topics and talk about the opioid epidemic. So concurrent with sort of our decreased length of stay, um, we're also seeing that there's issues with narcotic pain medications. And if you're paying attention to the news, uh, you would know that 
uh, overdose deaths from prescription drugs have quadrupled in the past 20 years. And certainly in some uh, cities or towns, it's, it's truly an epidemic and a major league issue. Over 180,000 overdose deaths between 1999 and 2015. And they say that one in 15 opioid naive patients will become dependent. And that includes patients who are having surgery for elective hip and knee replacements. I read an article and it showed that as a, um, as a uh, medicine specialty, orthopedics is the number three most common uh, uh, prescriber of narcotic pain medication. And, and there's good reason for that. Opioids still have a role in post-operative surgical pain management. Uh, in some respects, it still is the workhorse, but it's not the only thing that's done. And so here's why. We focus now on this philosophy of what's called multimodal pain management. So to understand this concept, you have to understand what pain really is. So pain comes from tissue injury or trauma to tissue that leads to inflammation, nerve damage, lack of blood flow. And what happens is the site of, of trauma or injury, whether it's you cutting your hand on a piece of glass or a surgical incision in your knee, it, it sends signals from the site of injury to the brain, and it does so over multiple parallel pathways that go up the spinal cord and up to the brain. And so what we've learned is that using multiple drugs and multiple techniques can affect these different pathways uh, simultaneously to better control pain, both in the short term and the long term. So if you're just using opioids, you're really only addressing one major pain pathway, but there's other pain pathways that are sending signals to the brain uh, that you can intervene. And so there's different drugs that can affect the pain pathways. Opioids are the obvious one, but also the non-steroidal anti-inflammatories, and that can be prescription ones or generic ones like ibuprofen, naproxen, examples of prescription non-steroidal anti-inflammatories would be things like Celebrex and Meloxicam, Diclofenac. There sometimes is a role for steroids just because they're powerful anti-inflammatories can help relieve pain, but not without side effects. Tylenol is involved in the regimen and Tylenol in a lot of respects has made a comeback because it's generally pretty safe. And then there's medications who were, that were created primarily for other medical indications, but were found to be helpful with pain, especially chronic pain. So that'd be like the benzodiazepines, which are helpful with anti-anxiety, but can also be helpful with pain. Some antidepressants or anticonvulsants, which are more commonly used for things like yes, epileptics, uh, anti-seizure medications can be helpful with chronic pain. There's topical ointments like capsaicin from the chili pepper, certain uh, anti-inflammatory uh, topical ointments that exist. And then more recently, uh, and probably gaining more popularity now, are the cannabinoids uh, from, from the cannabis plant, uh, which can be used to help sort of reduce narcotic requirements uh, as an adjunct for pain management. So in order to sort of fulfill this multimodal pain management, not only do we want to hit different pathways from the site of injury to the brain, but we want to address it throughout the entire perioperative experience. So it's not just postoperatively after surgery is done that we want to start focusing on pain management. We actually want to preempt it preoperatively. And so what happens nowadays is when you come in for a hip and knee replacement, most of us start by giving uh, oral pain medication before you even get your anesthesia. And it's usually some combination of Tylenol, a non-steroidal anti-inflammatory, uh, gabapentin or Lyrica, which is uh, in a sort of a, a nerve pain type of blocker, and then plus or minus opioids and sort of any combination of that. Different physicians have different uh, different. Uh, ways that they do this, but the idea is that you want to dull the sensitization and inflammation of the pain generator. So you're preempting your own tissue from having trauma. And so what it's been shown to do is if you start giving pre-op pain medication, it reduces immediate post-op pain. Another modality that's really increased with popularity in the last decade is this concept of regional anesthesia. So particularly in knee replacements, uh, we have our anesthesiology colleagues do um, nerve blocks. And so the, the most common one we use nowadays is called an adductor canal block, 
which is similar to a femoral nerve block. So it's, it's, it gets good distribution of the areas of pain, but without a motor blockade, meaning you're not gonna have weakness or buckling of the knees, you just get sort of pain control. There's other blocks, there's something called an IPAC block, where the anesthesiologists infiltrate behind the knee, that tissue, which is oftentimes very painful after knee replacements. And, and what the studies have shown is regional anesthesia and these nerve blocks have been extremely helpful for post-op pain control and significantly reduced narcotic requirements post-operatively by patients. And what this allows is a reduction of the depth of anesthesia that's necessary. So no longer does anesthesia have to put you in quite as deep of an anesthetic state with general anesthesia or long-term epidural anesthesia. They can do sort of a, a short-term spinal or just a, a, a general anesthesia, but lighter than before. And that leads to quicker waking up for patients, less post-op nausea, dizziness, and it promotes early ambulation and mobility. So that's all preoperatively. So the patient then undergoes their formal anesthesia and they're getting their surgery. And so we want to address pain intraoperatively. And one of the main ways we do this now, and the picture on the top right shows it, is we all for hip and knee replacements do what's called periarticular infiltration uh, with different joint cocktails. And so you can think of this like Novocaine at the dentist. So these are usually a combination of a local anesthetic mixed with sometimes anti-inflammatory, sometimes morphine, sometimes uh, other, other medications. And what we're doing is we're injecting all of the tissue in and around the knee to sort of uh, dull the pain and, and, and numb the pain. And it, that's been shown to be extremely effective. It's been a big game changer uh, for post-op pain. Um, for knee replacements, uh, there's been some people that have gone away from tourniquets. I actually went away from using tourniquets and didn't see a huge difference. But, but just with improved efficient surgical technique and, and sort of working quickly, reducing the time under tourniquet reduces tourniquet pain. And I think that's been helpful for patients. So, you know, you do your surgery and surgery is done. And then in terms of post-op pain management, so again, no longer are patients just laying in bed, pushing their button for their, you know, morphine fix every eight minutes. We're giving multiple pain medications to control pain while reducing the narcotic requirements. And the idea behind that is not just to prevent patients from getting dependent on narcotics, but to reduce the, the heavy side effect profiles that come with narcotics. And by doing that, by making patients less lethargic, less dizzy, less nauseated, it promotes early ambulation. It gets them mobilized quicker. And we have found that mobility is actually good for post-op pain. I was talking to one of the nurses at, um, at our surgery center last, last Thursday, um, and she was telling me that when a hip replacement comes out of surgery at the surgery center, and you know, with they, they say, give, give us rate your pain on a scale of one to 10, she said frequently they'll say it's an eight out of 10. As soon as they get up with physical therapy and put weight on it, start moving with a walker with some assistance, that pain goes down to a four out of 10. And so we're big believers that mobility reduces post-op pain. Uh, and so consequently, whether in a hospital or a surgery center, patients are ambulating very quickly. We want them up at latest within a couple hours after surgery. I think hydration and blood management, the relevance of that to this talk is that it's, it's so important to keep patients hydrated uh, and to keep them from getting very anemic uh, because when you're dehydrated, when you're anemic, you have that, those uh, symptoms of being nauseated, tired, fatigued, um, and, and that, again, makes it difficult to, to get up. You can uh, become hypotensive standing up. There's this medication called tranexamic acid, which has really been a transformative medication that we all give now. What it's, it's what's called an antifibrinolytic, which doesn't need to mean anything to you, but effectively what it does is it reduces the amount of blood loss. It's very cheap. It's readily available at any hospital, at any surgery center. We typically give it through the IV or you can do it topically. So if a patient has a contraindication or is not allowed to have it through the IV, you can can uh, use it topically within a wound. They're now exploring giving it to patients orally. Um, and it has reduced our blood transfusion rates 
by a, a real significant amount to, to the point where I can think of maybe one blood transfusion I've had to give for a primary hip or knee replacement in, in the last year. And again, that is just a dramatic shift from the past when I was a resident where we were, we were routinely giving blood transfusions on our post-op patients. So let's talk about what has changed between the past and the present. So we know patients tolerate joint replacements much better than in the past. Now, this is not to imply that joint replacement surgery is easy or that it's painless. The truth is it's not. And any doctor or any surgeon that tells you that it's a painless, easy uh, experience to go through, in my opinion, is being disingenuous. It still is painful to go through, but it's better tolerated than it was in the past we've gotten our length of stay down to about one day in most hospitals. So the average length of stay in my primary hospital is 24 hours in the hospital before patients go home. We also know that the percentage of patients going to skilled nursing facilities has gone down rapidly. In fact, the vast majority of patients getting primary hip or knee replacements now goes home after their hospital stay, even if they're doing it as an inpatient. So, in the last several years, uh, we as a, as a surgical community have really taken a leap. And so, you know, it, it, there's been this transition to outpatient or same day joint replacement surgery, and it's really surged in popularity. It was increasing in popularity really in the last five or six years. And then when COVID hit, and there was this fear of, do, of going into a hospital setting, the numbers really took off. And, and so as a consequence, we're doing more same day uh, total joints than ever before. Um, and, and we've learned through our own data and through the data available in the literature that hip and knee replacements can successfully be performed as an outpatient, both in the hospital, but also in an ambulatory freestanding surgery center uh, set. And this was the thought process. If patients are now spending only one day or one to two days on average in a hospital, and patients are mobilizing much more quickly than in the past, and we're reducing the amount of IV pain medication and blood transfusions, then the hospital's not really providing much on an inpatient basis than what can be performed for patients at home. I mean, whether they're getting a Norco pill or a Celebrex pill from the nurse in the hospital, that can be given at home. If we're not giving IV medication and we don't have Foley catheters in patients, physical therapy, walking in the hallway and, and doing exercises with weights, that can be done in a home setting. Uh, the hospital is really not providing much of a benefit. The other thing, and I always stress this to patients, the worst days after a joint replacement surgery in terms of pain are not the day of surgery, and they're not usually post-op day one either. Um, part of this is because patients have had a block, you know, a nerve block, and so the pain's not that horrible immediately after surgery. Some of it is because there hasn't been enough of an opportunity for swelling to set in, which can be painful. But the worst days in terms of pain after a, a knee replacement, for example, it's not days one or two. It's days four, five, six, seven, eight. And really all of those patients are home by that time anyway. So whether or not they had surgery in the hospital or in the uh, a surgery center setting, the worst day is not the day of surgery or the day after. And so because of that, you don't need to keep patients in the hospital necessarily for pain. And so with quality home health nursing and home physical therapy partners, uh, patients can get the same level of quality care, the same medication, the same exercises that they were receiving in a hospital setting, but there's benefits of being at home. Number one is the privacy of home, no sharing rooms with anyone, the comfort of sleeping in your own bed. The, a big one for us is decreased likelihood of hospital acquired infection. There is just no question that you are less likely to get an infected joint replacement if you go home versus if you sit in a hospital or go to a skilled nursing facility. Healthcare facilities have hospital acquired infections by definition, uh, we try to keep those rates low, of course, uh, but there is no safer place to be from an infection standpoint than in your home. And that is like COVID notwithstanding. That's, that's like, we've been, I've been beating this drum since long before the, the COVID-19 pandemic. And then finally, when you're home, you're reacclimating to the home environment. Um, if you're lucky enough to have a uh, good carry out or good cooks in the family, the food I hope is better in your home than it is in a hospital setting. 
although in my household that is questionable. So we have this outpatient uh, joint replacement uh, system that we put into place, and I want to go through what the keys for success are. Number one is appropriate patient selection. So the reality is, as the number of outpatient joints is increasing with our better ability to manage pain and, and early ambulation, the reality is outpatient joints is not for all cases. And, and there's patient factors and technical factors uh, that relate to this, this point. So for example, if a patient is elderly and low demand or a patient has diabetes and heart failure and uh, you know, other medical comorbidities, those patients probably should be in a hospital setting where they can be more carefully monitored because their risk of complications is higher. When I say technical factors, some patients have different deformities which lend to a more complex surgery. Maybe you need to have other equipment on backup or revision components on backup. And that is not the time to be in a ambulatory surgery center where you don't have uh, the whole portfolio of um, surgical instruments and uh, implants at your disposal. It's really important to have a coordinated team approach that involves all stakeholders throughout the continuum of care. So, so and that's, that's not just the patient and the surgeon, although those, those are two key members, of course, but we need to have a coordinated team that includes your physical therapists, your home health nurses, the anesthesiologists, your primary care physician, Everyone needs to be on the same page so that the surgical experience from start to finish goes seamlessly. And so because of that, we, we put a big emphasis on preoperative education. I think it's crucial because number one, I think preparation is critical. Uh, it's important for patients to know what to expect. We really want to manage expectations. And if patients know what to expect, their anxiety level goes down dramatically because they know that you know when they have pain or swelling or they get black and blue, um, it's expected. And, and they know that it's normal because they read the material and we had this discussion. They're much less likely to worry, to go to an emergency department, et cetera. And so because of this, and I try to put a huge emphasis on communication with patients. I mean, it's very important for physicians to explain uh, all of uh, the, the perioperative experience in language that patients can understand, give patients the opportunity to ask questions, um, because, you know, as always, the physicians and patients, they come from different places. And, and sometimes physicians have a difficult time of articulating um, medical information in a way that a patient can understand. And oftentimes, patients who have more of a timid personality are less likely to ask questions. And so I, I like to uh, emphasize dialogue and, and really give patients opportunity to ask questions so that they are comfortable because without patient joint replacement, you don't have a nurse at your beck and call 24 seven. So you really need to be motivated, well-educated for that kind of approach. Um, so patient education, it starts preoperatively with a dialogue and conversation in the office, reading material that we provide for patients, uh, both uh, written material as well as um, electronic material. And I really encourage my patients to read the material, take a few days, digest it, call with questions. You know, and, and by doing this, we're, we improve our patient satisfaction. And I always tell patients that patient satisfaction is a priority but never at the expense of patient safety. So patient safety is always the number one priority. And, and I certainly would never recommend outpatient joint replacement to a patient if I didn't think that it was a safe way to go. Um, for patients after we have that conversation and they're indicated for surgery, the patients typically obtain their medical clearance from their own um, primary care physician. Um, but each case has to be independently reviewed by the anesthesiologist or medical director. So there have been times where a uh, patient was uh, interested in an outpatient joint, uh, but the medical director at the surgery center for you know, a medical reason, a safety reason said, Jeff, this is someone that you may wanna take to the hospital. And so we really screen these patients very carefully to make sure that they are a safe candidate because safety really does trump all. I always have every patient return for a preoperative appointment, either with myself or my PA, 
for a couple reasons. Number one, I never liked the idea that if I meet some patient once and indicate them from surgery that the next time they're going to see me is in scrubs right before I cut. I, I just find that it is helpful to give patients the opportunity to see me in a in the clinic setting, in the office setting. It gives patients the opportunity to ask questions that they may have not thought of at their previous visit to uh, you know any concerns or clarifications that they need answered. We like to give them that opportunity. We also like to give the post-op prescriptions ahead of time in the clinic setting. The reason I do this is because, again, I want your anxiety level to be diminished. I want everything to be prepared for. I don't like the idea of discharging a patient from a hospital or a surgery center just to have Walgreens or CVS say that your pain medication will be ready in eight hours. I want your pill bottles waiting for you ahead of time. So on the day of surgery, that is not something you need to worry about. And then the pre-op visits, finally, it's, it's one other checkpoint for me to review the clearance, make sure that you've seen your doctor and that everything is cleared, your labs look good, and that we're good to go. Home health nursing and home physical therapy is always set up ahead of time. Uh, we feel very confident in the organizations that we engage with that do home health nursing and physical therapy, and we've really gotten um, good feedback from patients about their experience. Um, but we want that set up ahead of time. We want patients to know that on the day of surgery, they don't have to worry that no one's going to come see them or that it needs to be arranged or phone calls are going to need to be made after surgery. We want this to be a seamless process. On the day of surgery, so let's say in the surgery center setting, patients come in, uh, they're checked in and the, everything is reviewed with the pre-op nurses, including all the, that all their prescriptions have been filled and everything's good to go and that their home health physical therapy and nursing has been set up. Uh, patients uh, initiate their pain control, their multimodal pain management, starting preoperatively where they're given medication to uh, preempt their pain and, and, and also relax them. They get their, um, they get their blocks. Um, and then anesthesia is shortly thereafter performed. And again, usually for outpatients, we either use a general anesthesia because once they wake up, there's, uh, there's no motor blockade from a spinal and they can mobilize quicker, but it's perfectly acceptable. And, and we've also done short acting spinal anesthesias for our outpatients. Um, then the surgery is performed. Um, after surgery is successfully performed, the patient goes to what's called phase one in the recovery room, uh, and that's under the care of nurse, and that's as patients are awakening from anesthesia and their vitals are being checked and they're being resuscitated with, you know, if they need IV fluids, if their blood pressure is low. And then usually around 30 minutes after that, patients are transferred to what's called phase two, and that's where physical therapy is immediately ready to begin. So in our surgery center, it's all set up that as soon as a patient is stable from phase one to phase two, the physical therapist is there on site with equipment ready to get them up walking. And again, we find that when patients get up and start moving and walking with a walker, their pain level goes down. Usually within one to two hours of finishing surgery, the patient's discharged home with a family member or a friend. Um, and, and what's great is, so I'll give an example. Last Thursday, I did three total knees at our surgery center. For I did the first one. When I did my second surgery uh, and I came back to the recovery room, my first patient had already been discharged home. When I did my third case, finished that surgery, came to the recovery room, the second procedure of the day had already been discharged home. So it's it's a very efficient uh, system where everyone's ready to go. It's been well planned out ahead of time and it goes uh, very, very well. Home health nursing and physical therapy comes to your home the afternoon of surgery or the morning after at the latest. I wanna make sure that patients have uh, different people laying eyes on them. Um, usually myself or my team gives a patient a phone call post-op day one to check in. It's not so different than when we round at a hospital. It's a simple check-in to see how you're doing, make sure your pain's under control, answer any questions. And then throughout this period of time, especially that first couple days or first couple weeks, the patient, the home health nurse, home physical therapy needs to have an open line of communication to reach out to their surgical team with any questions or concerns. You know, I, I, I tell any home health nurse or physical therapist, if you have any questions related to my patients, you call me directly. I don't want you waiting 
in our call center or paging someone not getting a call back. If you want someone to look at a wound, you want to take a picture of a wound, you have any questions or concerns, you reach out to me directly or my PA to get your answers uh, that you need quickly. And again, not only is that good patient care, but it reduces patient anxiety. If you reduce patient anxiety, they're less likely to run to the ER uh, and get themselves admitted. After they've been doing home health, home PT for a few days or a few weeks, they otherwise begin rehabbing like any other total joint replacement that we would do if the patient had had their surgery done in an inpatient setting. So they quickly transition to outpatient physical therapy and do their surgeon uh, visits for routine post-op appointments as set by the surgeon. Uh, we find that most gains are really made in the outpatient physical therapy setting, so much more so that can be done in a hospital or can be done with home PT or in a skilled nursing facility. Outpatient PT really is the best physical therapy for a couple of reasons. Number one, there's more and better equipment, better quality control, and most importantly, and I always make the analogy to like, it's, it's a lot more effective if you go to a gym to work out versus going to the treadmill in your basement. Because if you take the time um, and are motivated enough to leave your home and go to another location for a certain purpose, you're more likely to take advantage of that. So we're big believers in quick transition to outpatient physical therapy, usually within a week or two. And actually some of our patients who are doing outpatient joint replacements, they go home and after a day or two, they immediately go to outpatient physical therapy and they, they sort of uh, opt out of doing home physical therapy in the first place. So we've talked about sort of how we got to why we're doing outpatient joint replacements, but, but you know, as we practice evidence-based medicine, I think the most important question is what does the data tell us? Is this safe? Is this effective? And there's some data out there. And, and you know, unfortunately, we don't have 30 years worth of data of outpatient joint replacements because it's a newer concept. It's a newer phenomenon that's really been done just in the last decade. Uh, here's a study done. Uh, this is out of um, in a private practice in Indiana that's been a high volume outpatient joint replacement um, practice, two year review of over 1200 hip and knee replacement patients they, they did in an outpatient setting. They did patient satisfaction uh, surveys and found 98 to 100% good or great satisfaction rates. Uh, their readmission rate for their outpatient joint replacement surgeries was 2%, which is in line or less than the readmission rate for all joint replacement surgeries, uh, including inpatient. Uh, and none of the readmissions were for pain control. And so, um, you know, seemingly good results. Here's one from a large claims database that uh, was done to study the in, inpatient versus outpatient joint replacement surgeries from 2014 to 2016 to complete, compare outcomes and relative costs. Again, we go back to that value proposition, outcomes over costs. And what they found is readmissions, post-surgical complications, and payments were all lower for outpatients than for inpatients. Now, there might be a little of what's called selection bias in that we typically are doing our healthier, uh, more uh, motivated patients in an outpatient setting. But generally speaking, if we're reducing readmissions and we're reducing complications and we're doing it in a way that is cheaper for patients and cheaper for their insurance companies, then we think we're doing a benefit to the entire system as a whole. So here's one that was done by uh, uh, actually down by Craig Delavalli at Rush. So what he did, he took 243 of his outpatient hip and knee replacements and he matched them demographically with 243 inpatient joints. So now there's no selection bias. He's not comparing his healthy patients to his unhealthy patients. He's taking 243 patients and he's matching them by age, you know, risk and medical profile to make sure that you're really doing an apples to apples comparison. And what he found was no statistical difference in readmission rates, major or minor complication rates, reoperations, ER visits, or unplanned visits to his clinic between his outpatient joints and inpatient joints. And so the conclusion was that uh, arthroplasty procedures can be performed safely in an ambulatory surgery center among appropriately selected patients without increased risk of complications. And that was within 90 days. And that's 90 days is typically when most complications occur within that 90 day window. 
this is a study, and I, I apologize that there's so much uh, typing on this page. So Brent Lanting, he, he's a guy in London, Ontario, he actually did my the same fellowship as me about two years before me. And so what he did, uh, he did this, what's called a systematic review of the literature where you go through databases and find kind of the most studies and the best studies and sort of put them all together to draw some conclusions. So there were 17 studies that met criteria um, on uh, about outpatient joints. And what he found was no increase in readmission rates, no increase in complications among outpatient joint patients compared to inpatients, higher level of satisfaction in the majority of patients. And the conclusion was that in selected patients, outpatient joints can be performed safely and effectively uh, although he does uh, give the caveat, most of these studies, because they're not huge numbers of patients, uh, they don't have the sufficient internal validity and sample size and methodologic uh, consistency and standardization. And so he does acknowledge that there still is a need for high quality prospective and randomized trials to really assess once and for all the safety and effectiveness of outpatient joints. And so I think the moral of the story is, the, the early data that's come out seems to point in a direction where outpatient joints are safe and effective. Uh, but, but there needs to be more data that needs to be carefully put together uh, before we can really make definitive uh, statements that it is 100% as safe as an inpatient. And until then, I think it's incumbent upon us as physicians to really uh, practice good risk stratification and risk screening so that we do the appropriate designation for patients. And so I think the consequences of this uh, era of enhanced recovery in outpatient surgery, I think we're improving our outcomes, we're reducing readmissions to the hospital, we're reducing complications, we're reducing costs to patients and the healthcare system, and we're doing this all while improving patient satisfaction. I think, you know, again, knee replacements, as an example, they're not pleasant to go through. Um, whether you have it at, an, at a hospital or at a surgery center, you know, it's truly a marathon, not a sprint. It takes weeks and weeks to fully recover from. Um, but I will say that the patients that have gone through an outpatient procedure at our surgery center, they're very satisfied with, with the way uh, soup to nuts, how it, how it goes from start to finish, because it's very well coordinated with good communication and, and patients have had a good experience despite enduring the typical aches and pains of having to go through surgery. In terms of future predictions, you know, I think the volume and burden of total joints is going to continue to grow exponentially, again, as the population ages. But I also am confident that the ability of, of us as physicians and as uh, as well as our colleagues in PT and nursing, I think will continue uh, to improve our ability to provide excellent outcomes that will meet the demands of patients going forward. I think a larger percentage of total joints are going to be performed in an outpatient setting. I think there's a demand for it. It's, been sh it's, it's currently being shown that it's safe and effective. Patients generally, I think, are interested in this. Uh, and, and I think payers are very interested in this too. I think the insurance companies are seeing as they're mulling over the data, because it's safe and effective and it's cheaper for them, there's an interest there. And so it, it's just, it's one example where kind of everyone's incentives seem to be aligning. Um, I would be cautious in terms of making a prediction of what that percentage is gonna be. There's a lot of people that that say, you know, 80% of total joints will be done in an ambulatory surgery center. That might be a little bit aggressive. You know, there, there are certain patients that are always gonna be safer to be done in a hospital setting. So I think what's gonna happen is, you know, in my own personal practice, it's grown every year and it's gonna grow faster. At some point, there will be kind of a leveling off or plateau. And I don't know if that means, you know, 40% of joints are gonna be in an outpatient setting or 30% or 60%. But I think it's a reasonable expectation that the percentage of joints in the United States that will be done in an outpatient setting is certainly going to continue to grow and be higher than the current percentage. And I think that as better data arises in the literature, it's going to guide our decision making. And eventually, these indications will be more standardized um, and we'll be able to really give patients good information that with your risk profile, you should do it as an outpatient. And here is why. Um, I think that'll be more standardized across the board, patient, uh, physician to physician. And so here's just some resources 
Um, the top one's my own website and then IBJI's website. The bottom two are uh, two of the governing bodies that have really excellent resources and good quality resources for patients. You know, I think there's a lot of um, there's a lot of information on the internet. You really need to be careful what you read. Um, ACUS, which is the American Association of Hip and Knee Surgeons, and then AAOS, the American Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons, um, they're, they're just reliable resources that'll give you good, true information, and I trust them implicitly. And so I, I appreciate your attention, and I hope that didn't go too long. I'm happy to answer any questions that you have, and I, again, appreciate um, everyone for having me and for the attendees for being here tonight. Thanks. All right. Well, thank you very much. I thought it was incredibly informative. I don't know if you already said this, but I don't think I heard it, Dr. Goldstein, but what percentage of patients currently are candidates for outpatient joint replacement, total joint replacement? So I think if I had to estimate that, and so this just means that if patients, you know, were motivated and wanted, if we're just talking from a pure safety standpoint and that logistically it makes sense, I would estimate that probably 25 to 30 percent of patients right now, I would feel comfortable saying 30 percent of my patients are good candidates for outpatient surgery. Um, and I think that if you asked me that question a year ago, I would have said it was 20 percent and the year before that, 10 percent. And so, again, I don't know where that percentage is going to level off, but it is not inconceivable that a year from now, I'm going to tell you that I think 40% of my patients can be done safely in an outpatient setting. Great. Thank you. Um, does this also apply, you know, you, you, you primarily focus on knees and hips. How about people with shoulder replacements and other types of joint replacements? Are, are, is it safe for them to have outpatient joint replacements? Yeah, so, so I think the answer is yes for certain patients. You know, one thing I'll tell you is when it comes to joint replacement surgery, hip and knee has always kind of led the charge because there's just more. There's more knee replacements and hip replacements in the United States compared to shoulder replacements or certainly compared to ankle replacements. And so, and that's always been the case. I mean, knee replacements and hip replacements have been around for longer. So we always joke that shoulder replacements are where hip replacements were 15 years ago. And yeah. so I think the point is, the answer is yes, certainly some of them can be done in an outpatient setting, but I, I doubt there is quite as much data out there because number one, there's fewer of those surgeries to begin with. And number two, they just don't have the longevity. So my prediction is that they can be and that they certainly will be if they're not already. But I think in terms of data, they're probably lagging behind hip and knee just because of sheer volume of cases being done. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, do you recommend doing both hips at the same time or one at a time? So two answers to that question. For hips, so number one, as from an outpatient standpoint, I, I would not do bilateral surgery. And the reason for that is, um, it's, it's a longer period of time under anesthesia. Uh, it is two pain generators. It is, uh, you know, two sources of bleeding, so more blood loss. So um, in terms of do I recommend it, uh, I think that you can do bilateral hip or knee replacements, but not, I do not think it's safe to do in an ambulatory setting. Now, just in general, do I recommend bilateral hip and knee replacement? I don't, I, I don't recommend it. Uh, there's some data out there that says that the risk of perioperative complications like heart attack stroke is higher when you do bilateral. Now, having said that, in the appropriate patient, I do do some bilateral uh, joint replacements. Um, and, and when done in the correct patient, uh, anecdotally, those oftentimes are the happiest patients. When, when, you know, with, when bilateral knee replacements or hip replacements do well, they're like the happiest patients when it's all said and done. Uh, however, I would say that it's indicated in a minority of patients and not in an outpatient setting. Got it. Thank you. That makes complete sense to me, too. Um, what if a patient lives alone? Are you, would, would you recommend someone for a, an outpatient total joint replacement if they live alone? Or would you recommend they have someone or even hire a caregiver to stay with them for at least a few days? So it's a, it's a great question. So there's, again, there's a lot of social concerns that go into it. So 
the, even before you talk about outpatient, you talk about just going home, even after a hospital stay for people that live alone. What's happened is Medicare, and Medicare oftentimes sort of sets the expectations for everyone else to follow. Medicare no longer accepts that patients who live alone like are automatically candidates to go to a rehab facility. In other words, Medicare believes that if you're if you're reasonably healthy and you don't sort of have a complex home environment or a lot of medical comorbidities, if you get a hip or knee replacement, your discharge disposition from the hospital is is more than likely going to be home. And if you go to a rehab facility, you can go, but Medicare is not going to pay for it. And you have to pay out of pocket. So from an outpatient standpoint, you can sort of apply it to that too, which is um, yes, we, we do outpatient joint replacement surgeries on patients who live alone, but it's important that, for, again, like in anything else, um, we want to make sure, you have to look at the whole picture, right? You look at their medical profile, you also look at a patient's social profile. So the, if a patient lives alone, do they still have a good support network around them? Do they have neighbors that they're close with? Do they have family that lives nearby, friends? You know, oftentimes, We'll have patients and they'll have a family member or friends stay with them for, I mean, the, honestly, just a couple days, two to three days before they really don't need someone living with them 24 seven. Remember, you know, four or five days a week, you're having home health nursing, home physical therapy coming and checking in on you. So we generally like someone to stay with them for the first one to two nights after that. And that's usually it. So yes, we do outpatient joints on patients who live alone. Great, thank you. Um, sort of along those same lines, um, how quickly will someone be able to do stairs? So in our surgery center, when they wake up, they start walking with uh, physical therapy with a walker, and then they go over and they start doing stairs. So it, the answer is immediate. Stair training, whether in the surgery center or hospital, is part of the immediate physical therapy in preparation for getting back to your home environment. Now, again, it, this is like one of those things where I say that and I, I don't want to give the impression that I think it's easy. So patients sometimes right. say, should I get a hospital bed on the first floor? You know, my, my bedroom's upstairs. And I say, I say the same thing I told my mother-in-law. I had my partner do her surgeries because I don't operate on family. But I said, you're going to schlep upstairs. You're going to sleep in your own bed. You're going to bathe in your own bathroom. Because again, you want patients to re-acclimate to their home environment. And that, that means you sleep in your own bed, you bathe in your own bathroom, things like that. And so uh, to answer your questions, it's not easy doing stairs after hip or knee replacements but patients manage, they do it, and they do it immediately. Awesome, awesome. So then that would lead one to ask, well, when can I drive? That's another, so <laughs> that's a great question. So <laughs> I always tell patients there's like the legal answer and then the practical answer. So number one, let's, so let's separate left, le left hip and knee surgery right. and right hip and knee surgery, right? Uh, unless you're driving stick, which is a minority, most patients drive with their right leg. So for left lower extremity surgeries, I just tell patients you can sort of drive once you're not doped up on narcotics whenever you're up to it. For the right side, from a liability standpoint, I always say I quote unquote clear you to drive at six weeks. I do not have a single patient that waits six weeks to drive. They all start driving before. And the best advice I could say is, you know, you, you do it kind of at your own peril. My only request is that do not do it when you're under the influence of pain medication. And the first couple times you do it, have a friend or family member in the passenger seat and, and drive around your neighborhood. Don't, you know, go on the Kennedy and go downtown your first time. Um, and so in, in terms of like on average, when do people drive? I would probably ballpark that at about three weeks would be average. Great, thank you, thank you. Okay, so we'll thank Holly for those two very good questions. Um, yes. uh, this next person is a candidate for a hip replacement soon for both of them, um, but still plays baseball and pickleball and was told that it would not be wise to continue playing if he has hip replacement. And what are the pros and cons of him continuing to play uh, after he has one and or both hips replaced? So, what I tell patients is this, you know, there's very few activities that I tell patients they're not allowed to do. So 
I don't recommend sprinting, jumping hurdles, or what's called plyometrics. Now, most people who need hip and knee replacements are not sprinting and doing plyometric activities. So when you talk about golf and tennis and things like that, pickleball, the answer is they can do that. There's always risk of injury. I mean, there, that's always going to be the case. And uh, listen, I've had people who run 5Ks on knee replacements. It's not that I recommend it. I just have patients that have done it. I've had patients that go back to, I have one guy who's a tennis pro. I've done all four of his joints, both hips, both knees. And he's a tennis pro and he plays singles competitive tennis. And it's just one of those things where as long as you know there is always some risk. I mean, listen, without surgery, there's going to be some risk. You can right. sprain the ligament. You can injure yourself. Um, I, you know, I don't really put those restrictions on people. They just need to know that, of course, you're less likely to injure yourself for the prosthesis, you know, if you do heavy-duty athletic activity. Now, having said that, I will tell you, the prostheses are much more durable and they're 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 more durable than you realize i mean they are in some respects the strongest part of your body they, they don't just like get jarred loose very easily so if you're playing pickleball or you know you're playing i mean even softball or baseball the reality is it may not be recommended by your physician but i'm going to tell you in most cases it's probably uh, okay and i and i say that just in my own experience of having had patients that water ski and snow ski again and you know do all sorts of different physical activities the, the goal is to you do the surgery to get yourself active again the goal is not to make you sedentary it's to relieve pain so you can do the things you like to do and you really shouldn't be restricted unless you're going too crazy gotcha good good question or good answer thank you um another question is so for people who've had joint replacements years ago and need to have them replaced again mm -hmm. would, th would those people potentially be candidates for total joint replacement in an outpatient setting so in a in a, the answer is in a very limited uh, percentage of those and that's because so revision surgery and, and i do a lot of that stuff it's it's i like i put my primary joint replacements in one bucket and revision joint replacements in another bucket because Revision surgery typically is bigger, higher risk. I mean, it's just like a, it's a bigger thing to go through. Now, within revision joint replacement, there is a huge spectrum, meaning it could be something as simple as you could be healthy, you had your hip replacement at a young age, and your plastic's just worn, you just need what's called a head and liner exchange. Well, the answer is yes, you can do that as an outpatient. On the other hand, if you have a loose stem on your hip replacement you need a formal component revision where you're going to be on weight bearing restriction of course those are much bigger surgeries with bigger incisions and more blood loss that would not be appropriate in an outpatient setting so i think the answer to answer your question um there are there are some limited indications for outpatient revision surgery but it has to be the smaller scale type of revision surgery. I'm sure there's some people around the country that have pressed the envelope a little bit with this. Uh, I, I would not recommend doing that if you're looking at bigger revision surgery. The pitfalls are, are much larger, complication rates are higher, surgeries are more complex. I do those in, in a hospital setting. Gotcha, great, great. And are today's prostheses that are, that are um, put in during outpatient the same as those that are put in during inpatient it's based, it's the same surgery correct it's just a different yeah so i intentionally didn't put a lot of uh emphasis on the actual surgical procedure itself in, in this talk and that's because that for me whether it's a hip or knee replacement I, there's nothing i do differently technically um when i do a total hip replacement in the surgery center versus in an inpatient setting it's, you know, we obviously want to be tissue friendly and we want to, you know, put your components in appropriately and be respectful of, of your soft tissues and reduce your risk of complications. But from a technical standpoint, from a uh, prosthesis standpoint, there is nothing I do different in an outpatient setting than I do in an inpatient setting for the surgery itself. Great. That's 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 what I figured, but I thought it was it would it would be you know interesting to find the, the answer to that. So it's basically the same thing. It's whether or not someone's a candidate for outpatient versus inpatient, given their situation. 
Um, there was a question for some from someone, I'm 88 years old, am I a candidate? And it sounds like that person could be depending on their joint health and their physical health, et cetera. Exactly. Remember, it's like we 88 is a number. Um, but what matters is not chronologic age. What matters is physiologic age. And so, as you know, not every 88-year-old is in the same place in life. You have some 88-year-olds who are independent and they are community. They drive, they walk, they go out to dinner, they shop. And then you have 88-year-olds that are elderly and sedentary and low demand and live in assisting li assisted living facilities. And so the point is, I, I never really, you know, I, I, I would say that it's probably less common for an 88-year-old to be done in an outpatient setting. Um, we would more than likely do it at a hospital. Um, but, I mean, listen, I've been doing patients in their late 80s and early 90s that certainly go home the next day. So I don't think it's unreasonable if they are physiologically young. Excellent. And then last question, are you still taking new patients? <laughs> I'm always taking new patients and I don't cap my schedule and I, I see a lot of patients and uh, you know I, I've been here at IBJI for seven years and you know I guess COVID notwithstanding where everyone sort of <laughs> slowed down a little bit for obvious reasons I've been growing every year and you know I always say I, I, I still want to be twice as busy as I am so the, to answer your question yes I'm taking new patients and I'm happy to see whoever and offer opinions and I try my best to do good work for people. Terrific so for those of you whose questions were entered that were a little bit too personal for me to ask tonight. Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein's information is on the screen and you can uh, reach out to him and ask him directly your questions so that you can get them answered you know, with, with, with a little bit more personal attention than, than this group tonight. Dr. Goldstein, thank you so very much for being with us tonight. And I thank also you. do wanna take a moment to promote our July webinar. Um, the topic will be Heal Pain and Beyond with Dr. Carla Gamez, Wednesday, July 28th at 7 p.m. So again, Dr. Jeffrey Goldstein, thank you again so much for a terrific presentation. Uh, as you know, I was especially interested and I threw in some of my own questions, so thank you. Uh, it was terrific. Your answers were, were really helpful. And um, I hope everybody has a great night. And again, thank you, Dr. Goldstein, for your time and for putting this together for us. Thank you again. I appreciate it.